à partir de maintenant, nous allons ouvrir une série euh, de, euh, de présentations sur l'actualité de la recherche sur le terrain. Et euh, j'ai donc la chance d'avoir à côté de moi euh, Timothy Harrison, euh, qui est donc professeur au Department of uh, Near and Middle East Civilization de l'Université de Toronto. Euh, il a été également président de « The American Schools of Oriental Research » et euh, qui est une organisation qui soutient la recherche sur l'histoire du, du, du Proche-Orient ancien. Euh, il dirige le, le projet de Tel Madaba, un site de Jordanie. Évidemment, il dirige euh, les fouilles sur le site de Tel Tainat, dont il va maintenant nous, nous parler. Il est également à la tête du Crane Project, le Computational Research of Ancient Near East, euh, qui euh, justement euh, utilise les nouvelles technologies pour la compréhension donc de, de données archéologiques et euh, il donne et, euh, différents enseignements et fait de nombreuses publications euh, sur aussi bien sur la Syrie du Nord et également sur le Levant Sud et notamment la, la Palestine. Et donc c'est un très grand honneur pour nous de le voir revenir au Louvre puisqu'il était déjà venu nous voir en 2013 mais vous allez voir euh, il y a toujours et encore de nouvelles découvertes à Tel Tainat. Merci à vous. Thank you. Yassan, for the very kind introduction and also for the opportunity to participate in this conference. It is a real pleasure uh, to be here. One of the enduring mysteries of the ancient Mediterranean world concerns the epic collapse of the powerful states of Bronze Age civilization with their rich cultural and literary traditions at the end of the second millennium BCE and the ensuing early Iron or Dark Age, as it is often invoked, which ushered in a prolonged era of cultural devolution, political fragmentation, and ethnic strife, at least according to conventional historical interpretation. The recent results of archaeological research, however, have begun to challenge this understanding, and a new emerging consensus suggests a considerably more complex reality marked by both continuity and change. In the time I have this afternoon, I would like to focus on one particular area. The North Orontes Valley, or as it's often referred to, the Amuk Plain, played an important role during this transitional era. In the preceding Middle and Late Bronze Ages, the region was controlled by the Kingdom of Mukish, ruled from Alalakh located at the modern site of Tel Achana, situated at the northern bend of the Orontes River. In the latter part of the Late Bronze Age, however, Alala came under the control of the Hittite empire builder, Shupiluliuma, and his successors appear to have incorporated the kingdom into the Hittite empire until its collapse at the end of the 13th century. What caused this demise and what happened during the ensuing centuries of the early Iron Age continue to draw considerable scholarly interest. Recent epigraphic discoveries and the archaeological field research point to the rise of a powerful Neo-Hittite state identified with the land of Palestine, with Kunalua, its royal city, located a few hundred meters from Alalak at nearby Tel Tainat. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I will summarize just briefly a few of the new epigraphic discoveries. Thankfully, we've already learned about most of them, or at least the most significant ones in some of the earlier presentations. We heard about the uh, spectacular finds and discoveries from the storm, the great uh, storm god temple of Aleppo, and more specifically in our context, the reference to King Teta um, as, predict, or as uh, portrayed in this relief inserted into the older sequence as Professor Kohlmeier mentioned earlier this morning. And of course, the now famous reference to him being both the hero, ruler, and most intriguingly, a ruler of the land of Palestine. Since the discovery at the temple in Aleppo, there have been both a re-examination of inscriptions that had been discovered, some cases 60, 70 years before, without fully realizing perhaps their historical significance, as well as the discovery of quite a few new hieroglyphic inscriptions. We've just heard about uh, Shezar and the Shezar inscription, as well as the Meher de Ishtila, and I will come back to those two a little bit later in my presentation. 
We haven't heard yet, though, today about another a recent discovery that has only just been very recently published by um, a group of scholars led by Ale Dinjol from Tustila, discovered in a site called Arsus, a resort town south of uh, Iskandarun on the coast of the Mediterranean. And here you see them. Again, I will come back and say something more about this remarkable discovery shortly. There are two stela, very similar, um, with both inscription on one side and a uh, detailed relief uh, depicting the storm god as well as the ruler on the other. Again, as I said, I don't have time to go into the historical detail, but what is remarkable is the growing number of inscriptions almost every year there are new discoveries and this information is beginning to fill in the historical information for this period and the kingdom that I want to focus on, specifically the kingdom of, or the land of Palestine, which we believe was centered at the site of Tel Tainot and I will try and describe and explain that in more detail. Prior to this new discoveries, we already knew something about this kingdom in the form of uh, its reference in Neo-Assyrian sources uh, that describe um, as many as half a dozen, six or seven rulers who were associated with the kingdom of either Patin, as it was referred to sometimes, or the kingdom of Unki in other cases. And it has now become clear that this same kingdom is the same uh, place referred to in the earlier inscriptions, going back to the, at least the 11th century, if not even possibly the 12th century, that has been associated with the land or kingdom of Palestine. Geographically, we are referring to an area that is in the northern part of the Orontes Valley, um, where it enters into the Amok Plain, or the Plain of Antioch, as it's referred to in classical times. And I mentioned the two sites. You can see them together, the sites of Tel Achana, ancient Alalak, and its uh, sister settlement, the site of Tel Taina, a few hundred meters away, which together form a long continuous history of settlement from the Bronze Ages down through to the end of the Iron Age. And for they are clearly uh, controlling a strategic um, intersection that provides access up into the Anatolian highlands to the north, the uh, Syrian steppe to the east in the interior, and the uh, Mediterranean coast and the Aegean world uh, to the west. The first expedition to Taina was in the 1930s, between 1935 and 1938, four large-scale excavations by the Syrian Hittite expedition of the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, which produced large substantial exposures of the citadel and some of the palaces and also temple and other public buildings of the Neo-Hittite uh, uh, upper city of the site. Here you see some photographs just to give you a sense of the complex. I, with the time I have left, I want to focus really on two major architectural phases of this uh, earlier excavations and connect them to our own excavations, um, which began as the Tainat Archaeological Project with excavations commencing in full-scale excavation in 2005. Some of you may remember I was here actually a few years ago and gave some uh, greater detail about the larger project and uh, details uh, from the early seasons of those excavations. So in the time I have left, I would like to focus on what's referred to as the first building period by the Chicago expedition, as well as their second building period, which coincides to the, mostly to the 10th century down through to the end of the uh, eighth century, the peak period of the Neo-Hittite kingdom of Palestine or Patin or Unki, as you may prefer to refer to it. Our excavations have focused primarily in the vicinity on the edge, if you will, of the west central excavations of the Chicago expedition. And in this earliest phase, the building period one, there are two very large structures uh, that were initially uncovered by the Chicago expedition. And this is part of what we refer to as building 13 and 14. These are monumental buildings. If uh, we are correct, we are still have a lot more excavation to do. But if we are correct, we're uh, looking at a building that is at least 100 meters long by maybe as much as 50 meters wide. So it's a very large complex. 
and stratigraphically, we can say with confidence that it is situated between the earlier Iron Age sequence, which I will have to let uh, for another day, um, and then the later Iron Age remains excavated by the Chicago team as a part of their second building period. So stratigraphically, this complex must date to, um, at the very latest, the early 9th century, probably going back into the 10th century. We don't know, possibly even earlier into the very end of the 11th century. Now, as a part of the Chicago excavations, they began finding fragments of hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions. And uh, those inscriptions included, uh, most famously, what's known as Tainat Inscription 1, which makes reference to one of the kings. And um, as part of our investigations, we have been trying to locate the provenance of all of these fragments, about 100 fragments. And we have been able to identify that most of them must be in the vicinity of Building 14. And so uh, we think it's very likely, although we cannot be certain at this stage, very likely that these uh, monuments were um, contemporary with this uh, main building period, sometime in the 10th to 9th centuries BCE. If I can move to the second building period, this is the most famous and best documented going back to the Chicago excavations, famous for its Bitilani palaces and also for building two, the uh, temple that has often been used uh, as a parallel for many of the other West Syrian temples uh, from this period. But if you can see in the area that has been highlighted, we began excavating in this area in 2008 and 2009 and we're able to uncover a second uh, temple. This material in its terminal phase dates to the end of the Iron Age. It's from the Assyrian period. I don't have time again to focus on this. I want to focus just with my remaining time on the excavations that relate to the building period two complex. But here you can get some sense of the nature of this building, which we believe has an earlier phase that dates to the uh, Neo-Hittite period, but which we have yet to excavate. However, for now, what we can say with some confidence, if we continue to focus on the fragments of hieroglyphic Luvian uh, material, we can identify that most of these fragments from the Chicago excavations, as well as now from our own excavations, were concentrated in the area that I've highlighted here. And we believe that they were part of monuments that were standing in a piazza or plaza, an open paved area here between the two temples. Unfortunately, they had been uh, extensively dis damaged, smashed, and broken. However, one um, platform that we think might have been intact going back to the Chicago excavations is this uh, square uh, installation, which we were able to locate as situated immediately or directly in front of the new temple, our Building 16. So uh, we think it may well have been the platform for some of the monuments, which we have found only fragments broken uh, and scattered around the vicinity. To give you an impression, one of the better uh, preserved fragments has been identified as part of our second inscription, Tainat Inscription 2, and we have been able to confidently locate other fragments from this monument, which was a stela, probably square-shaped, in this immediate vicinity. And so it's plausible, at least, we cannot yet be certain that it was from a stela that was originally installed on the platform I showed you. Now, in our most recent excavation seasons, beginning in 2011, 2012, and continuing up through last year, 2018, we have been investigating in between the two temples in this plaza area, highlighted on the photograph there, our intention, to be very honest, was to look for earlier phases of the temple complex. We didn't expect what we were shortly to discover. And the first discovery was really in the first week or two of the excavation in 2011. And it became uh, very sensational when we were able to uncover the full uh, st sculpture of this uh, large, intact, uh, in pristine condition lion that you see uh, illustrated here. This lion uh, is, has generated a lot of discussion, and I don't have time to go into lots of detail other than to make two key uh, primary points. 
One is that it represents aesthetically something that is unparalleled, at least to our knowledge in the Near East or even the broader uh, Asian context in terms of its ability to um, project the nuance and detail of the lion figure. A uh, second point is, in contrast to what some have argued, that this might have been influenced by an Eastern, let's say a Syrian uh, cultural tradition, it must almost certainly be a local indigenous one, in part because we can show parallels from the Chicago excavations, including the uh, double lion column base that you see here, excavated by them in the 1930s in the portico of building two, the temple from those excavations. And you can, I think, even very quickly see that although there are a few subtle differences, it is strikingly similar in, its, uh, um, in, the, in the similarity of the detail and of the overall uh, production of the, of the two uh, sculptures. Now, for parallels, some have pointed out uh, in the form of small um, bronze uh, metal weights, like you see illustrated here, which were found in uh, various neo-Assyrian cities like Khorsabad and uh, Nimrud, which, by the way, as I note here, uh, frequently have Phoenician inscriptions on them, as well as um, this beautiful carved ivory, which has striking similarities in terms of its detail, again found in Nimrud. Um, I think these provide very helpful uh, analogies in the small form that they represent, but it's almost certainly that these are pieces that were brought to Assyria from the West, maybe even from Tainat, as far as we know. Uh, we'll never be able to be uh, certain about the sourcing, but these were almost certainly brought as part of tribute or payment um, or, or, or um, even loot taken by the Assyrians during the campaigns that they conducted in the West uh, during the uh, 9th and 8th centuries, including specifically in the region of Tainat or ancient Kunilua. More, I think, important is to recognize that the sculptural tradition is part of a long-standing tradition that goes even back into the Bronze Age in the Anatolian context um, in the form of portal lines like the ones you see illustrated here from various Iron Age Neo-Hittite sites that we've already had uh, presented um, in various contexts this uh, earlier today. We also have double lion uh, um, sculptures like you can see here. And it's no, it's no stretch to really emphasize that the Tainat lions, both of them, are clearly part of a Neo-Hittite sculptural tradition. Further, if you wish, um, although in the form of sphinxes, you can see here um, double column bases from Zingerli. As we continued our excavations, the next season we began to find more of these sculptures, including this uh, very unique column base that has a winged bull figure facing uh, you, and then on the side is a sphinx uh, figure. So far for us, uh, a unique piece um, that hasn't produced uh, really very close parallels. Thirdly, uh, thus far only a, a, a fragment, we have part of a pedestal or large statue base with uh, a protome lion, as you can see on the left, and then uh, part of the human figure in the middle. Uh, for parallel, there's a very close parallel in the form of the pedestal from uh, Zingerli, just a few uh, kilometers to the north of Tainat. The third uh, piece of dis uh, sculpture that was the discovery in uh, 2012 season, which again has received lots of attention, the statue of uh, Shupililiuma. And uh, the point I would like to emphasize here about this figure is that I believe it represents a kind of combination of what are the ideal attributes of uh, a good, successful, and, and loyal king, in the, and these are projected through the image, but at the same time there's an attempt to try and make an expression of uniqueness to who this king is. He's not unique in the form of the sculpture because we already have found at least one other uh, sculpture um, from Tainat, going back to the Chicago excavations in the form of what we now often refer to as the Colossus head you see depicted here. We also have um, the piece that's already been discussed earlier from Carchemus, in which you can see on display in the exhibit hall. But on the reverse, on the back side of the Shupililiuma statue is part of an inscription 
And um, I should note, since it was mentioned in, uh, by Dr. Aro, um, the, this kind of representation, you can see it here also on the Shupiluliuma um, uh, inscription here. It's an autobiographical statement, and this is the unique part of this uh, statue, the expression of the accomplishments that this particular king, Shupiluliuma, is claiming uh, that, a, that combines with the kind of representation of him as an ideal king who's fulfilling the duties of a, of a, of a successful ruler. There has been a lot of discussion and study now of the inscription, including both the uh, philology and syntax, and uh, most of these fall very comfortably into a, a ninth century or earlier date. I won't take time to read the inscription, but uh, we have been able to find multiple fragments now, dozens of fragments with small pieces of hieroglyphic Luvian, including this piece that you see here, which preserves part of the reference to the place or kingdom of Wallastein, Palestine, Wallastein. And this is now the second, and we have, a, have actually unreported yet a third um, occurrence of the reference to Wallastein in the fragments that we have been finding in our excavations, which clearly indicates that we must be dealing with the context of the kingdom of Kunalua, uh, uh, the, the, the capital uh, royal city of uh, Taita. So thus far, as part of a very much an active and ongoing investigation, our investig excavations have produced the, the fourth key inscription, the Tainat inscription four, and we have fragments, at least 110 fragments, um, that are from other monuments, including body parts, if you will, um, pieces of ears and other parts of, of human figures that clearly must be from other statues that we have yet to fully uh, excavate. In terms of the research that has been done about who Shupiluliuma was, uh, it's been proposed by uh, Mark Whedon in his analysis that uh, it must be the what we're now referring to as the second Shupiluliuma, the one who's referred to um, in the Assyrian records as giving tribute in 858 BCE. I'll come back to uh, the second possibility in a moment. Lastly, in our excavations most recently in 2017, as we began to expand a little bit in this area, looking for more stratigraphic context for the sculptures that we had found uh, previously, uh, we came down on yet another uh, remains, and this is something we have yet to fully uh, report, um, but you can see here um, the sort of extraction process, if you will, of our discovery of yet another statue, this of a female figure, in her case, um, very uh, heavily damaged, uh, we believe intentionally and, and perhaps ritually uh, damaged or um, um, destroyed, disfigured, if you will, um, in antiquity. Uniquely, in contrast to the other fragments or other sculptures that we have excavated, in the case of our, the female statue, she was lying in a bed of about 30 or 40 centimeters, filled densely with thousands and thousands of fragments of um, basalt material from either her statue or we believe actually from some of the others. And we believe this may have been a kind of preparatory area where they were um, preparing the um, uh, removal and the um, uh, discard in a ritual sense of the sculptures into the places where we have found them in our excavations. And so we are now beginning this process of trying to understand what um, occurred, what was the reason for the damage, was it accidental, was it intentional? Our um, preliminary interpretation is that it was an intentional um, process of trying to erase the memory, if you will, um, of the figure of the individual concerned. And as a kind of uh, quick analogy, we can point out that in many of the Neo-Hittite sculptures, including some that we've seen already today, this is a common occurrence. We've seen the statue from Zingerli and you may have noticed that his nose is missing, as well as his hands. Similarly, on the statue of the king from Malacha, the hands have been disfigured as well. And if I go back to the Arsu stela, that I, two stelae that I mentioned earlier, we have actually remarkably, in the first example, a representation, by now hopefully familiar, of the storm god, and he is leading a human figure in contrast, by the way, to the Aleppo example, the human figure is much smaller and is following here the storm god. In this case, we have 
Ei's face, and we know from the accompanying inscription that this is Shupiluliuma, the king. And this begs the question, of course, immediately, is this the same Shupiluliuma as depicted on the statue from uh, Tainat? Arsus is just a few kilometers away, and very likely with, within the uh, boundaries, the domain of the kingdom of Palestine. Interestingly, in this second stela, however, we have some important differences in terms of how the king is depicted, but most interestingly in this context, I believe that he is, his face has been uh, ritually removed, I believe intentionally, and I think that this is yet another example of this um, kind of uh, attempt to erase the memory of a historical figure. As my colleague James uh, Osborne has recently proposed, a kind of counter-monumentality process so the last question uh, I want to um, come to before I close is the question of who. Who perhaps might be this uh, female statue that we have been uh, recently uncovering at Tainot? And uh, for my uh, quick and summary, uh, brief summary, is to refer to a few examples that we have from nearby Carchemish. In particular, we have two representations of the queen. Uh, uh, both of these uh, are from the uh, well-known context, one in the King's Gate, which you see here, where we have a reference to the beloved wife as Tawanana of King, uh, of, of King Katua. Um, even more intriguing for me is the second example, where we have the representation of the wife of Sh Suhi, presented in the long wall uh, sculpture leading up to the uh, uh, staircase uh, into the citadel area and you see her here and she seems to have a very similar representation including the veil or shawl that she is wearing over her head. So I think very likely we are looking at Tainat in the, fe the female figure of a representation not of a god per se but of a human figure perhaps who has been immortalized after her death. Who might she be, uh, the, if, if not a god or goddess? Then um, the proposal that I find most intriguing is the possibility that we might know her name. Uh, we don't have an inscription yet from the material we've excavated, but you will recall from the um, earlier presentations and the, my earlier reference to the Meherde uh, stela, where we have a representation of a female figure who was either the mother or wife of Teta, and you see her represented here. And even in my mind, more intriguing is the Shezar inscription, where if you note towards the end, and we heard the reading of the main part of the inscription, but towards the end, it also gives this reference to, with a very enigmatic, um, I think the, there's still some discussion about how to translate and, and understand and interpret the meaning of the divine queen of the land. And an often uh, forgotten piece, finally, which has come, just a few kilometers away from Tainat, in the Amuk Plain, Kurcholu, is this very weathered piece of a small statue of a female figure. We see only her skirt and her feet, and a very poorly preserved hieroglyphic inscription, of which there's enough preserved to be able to capture, again, this reference to the divine queen of the land. So, while we can't be certain yet, and I'm speculating here, but it's very, very tempting to propose that we have in Tainat a statue that is a representation of Kupi Papia, the, who might have been either the mother or the, um, uh, the queen of the uh, founder of the dynasty that ruled at Tainat, and who in a sense became and embodied the Tawanana that we know well about from earlier, particularly uh, Bronze Age Hittite uh, context. And very lastly, very quickly, and very speculatively, I can't resist but to note that there is a very long tradition as we continue down into the later post-Iron Age period, even into the classical era in the area of Antioch, of representations of this very powerful uh, patron goddess, um, either the Antioch uh, Caranonian as well as the TK that you see here. And that it may be that there is a preservation of a much older tradition that goes back, extends back at least into the Iron Age, if not perhaps even earlier, as reflected in the female statue that we have found. Finally, I would also like to note that we have begun working on this very um, extensive effort to try and piece 
these sculptures uh, together. Uh, this is a project that has only begun. You, you can see the, the uh, preliminary efforts underway here, including our efforts to try and, in a sense, put the female statue back together. You can see some earlier attempts to try and reconstruct what she might have looked like from some of the pieces that we've been able to locate in that effort. As I close, I'd like to just come back to the larger context of these sculptures. These are clearly uh, sculptures that have been deposited um, and decommissioned uh, ritually um, in, a, in a process to try and remove them from, and perhaps from their evocative powers, uh, to take them out of circulation. We're also almost certain that these may have been a part of a complex in a gate system that would have originally led up to the citadel of the Neo-Hittite complex. There's very much more that we still must do uh, to try and make a better case for this. Considerable effort, uh, therefore, remains to fully excavate and delineate the sculptures and sculptural vestiges that once formed this potential uh, citadel, citadel gate complex at Tainot. Nevertheless, when combined with the monumental palatial and religious buildings of the west central area to the north and to the west in the area of Gateway 7 to the east with its royal, uh, possible royal statue, the Tainat Colossus that I mentioned, and the elevated Temenos crowned by a Neo-Syrian governor's residence to the south, which I didn't have uh, time to refer to in this area here. A broader conceptual understanding of Tainat's Neo-Hittite royal citadel, I believe, is starting to come into view. That this elaborately constructed elite zone replicates spatial patterns evident in the citadel complexes of other contemporary Neo-Hittite royal cities in the region, such as at Karkamesh, at Halaf, ancient Guzana, and Zinjerli, ancient Samal, to the north, is now well documented. Luvian inscriptions hint at the launching of ambitious royal building programs or new foundations by royal proclamation in conjunction with the emergence of the Neo-Hittite states in the early Iron Age, as Professor Stefania Mazzoni argued uh, already several decades ago in a pivotal study on the central motivation for these new foundations by the creation of regal cities as a means of leg legitimizing royal authority. As such, these royal cities represented an ambitious attempt to embody the hierarchical power structure and political order their newly emergent elite sought to project, in effect producing carefully crafted landscapes of power that blended kingship with divinely sanctioned authority. Although the specific historical circumstances remain elusive, the accumulating archaeological and textual evidence point to the existence of a powerful regional kingdom, the land of Palestine or Wallastine, which emerged in the aftermath of the Hittite Empire's collapse, ruled by a line of, of kings with Hittite names, and very possibly with direct ancestral links to the royal dynasty at Hattusha. Centered at Tel Taina, ancient Kanalua, the wealth of this hypothesized early Iron Age kingdom is reflected in the impressive buildings and standing monuments preserved on its royal citadel. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.